Please be seated. Class of 2017, family and friends, welcome to the icon of the university, Duke Chapel. We gather in this space for this baccalaureate service as we celebrate your many accomplishments and to give thanks to God. Let us pray. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. You are the wellspring of joy and life. Fill us with the light of this day and of your love. We honor you as our hearts, full of thanksgiving, unfold like the flowers of spring before you. The sun of your grace illuminated our paths on this journey. We thank you for the process of learning and growth through curricular and co-curricular activities for the vast opportunities and challenges that stretched us as human beings and helped us to become more generous citizens of the world, and for those who invested their lives in our lives, making this journey at Duke possible. We thank you for the mighty Blue Devil Chorus that supported us on this educational pilgrimage. But we also remember those who began this journey with us but are not present today, and those who haven't had the privilege to study at a place like Duke, and those who are often forgotten on society's roadsides. As we end this stage of the journey and begin another, may we share cheerfully and liberally all that we have gained in mind, body, and spirit for the common good. And may we do justice, love kindness, and always walk humbly before you, God of glory and Lord of love. Most of all, teach us how to love each other. Amen. Today's lesson is from the book of Luke, the 14th chapter. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of the leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host, and the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place, and then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He also said to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. When you entered this space, the first thing that might have struck you is seeing some classmates you thought would never graduate. A second thing you might have noticed are the beautiful stained glass windows or the high vaulted ceilings. You may not have noticed that green devil in one of the stained glass windows or the two wooden mice that keep residence in this building or even the video cameras. The cameras are running, which might make you reconsider falling asleep. They watch us from the margins of this building. They are not front and center. They are on the borders. And we might not even notice that they are there. They pay attention to us, but do we pay attention to them? Margins, borders matter. In a 2016 Olympic tennis match, Jack Sock was playing Leighton Hewitt. 
And Hewitt served the ball and the umpire called it out. It was so close that to Sock it looked in. And so in a very unusual fashion, Sock told Hewitt to challenge the call. You can see the chair umpire looking at Sock as if he was crazy and thinking, what the? You can hear the audience chuckling in surprise. They can't believe what's happening. And so eventually the umpire reviewed the call and the ball was shown to hit the line. Thus it was actually in, giving Hewitt a point. Sock risked losing a point in order to be just. He chose to go against the grain and investigate what happened on the line, on the margins, and not ignore what happened there. Because just as in tennis, what happens on the margins, on the border lines of society, matter. It can change the game, and it can change your life. If we neglect the margins, we won't see the full picture. Margins matter in tennis and even around dinner tables. We often find Jesus around a table because he was an ancient foodie. He loved the new West Union building with all of the eating options, especially the Indian food at Tandoor. <laughs> at a last supper with his disciples, he even told them that he wanted to be remembered by a meal. Do this in remembrance of me. And in today's story, he's going to eat a meal he tells a parable about another meal and then another story about a, another meal. But what's telling about Jesus is not the actual meal, but who is at the meal. He eats with religious leaders, of course, but when he moves beyond his respected acquaintances, he raises eyebrows. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? That's like asking, why are you hanging out with the Tar Heels? He gets critiqued for how he minds the margins. Because as the saying goes, show us who you eat with and I'll tell you who you are. At the table, Jesus gives two instructions. The first is when you are invited, go sit down at the lowest place. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled and all who humble themselves will be exalted. Humility gets a bad rap in our day, I know. Some of you may be thinking, are you kidding me? I mean, this was not my approach to getting into Duke or being hired at a consulting firm or winning this fellowship. I wasn't chosen because I was humble. None of us get a job offer because we're humble. On the contrary, you get accepted or are chosen for boasting about your achievements, demonstrating how gifted you are, how much you did in the community, how you excelled in the classroom or on the field, what you created and now have a patent for. Am I right? Think about the Duke Carolina rivalry even. What do Duke fans say to their Tar Heel opponents even if we lose? That's all right, that's okay, you will work for us someday. <laughs> Not much humility there. What Jesus teaches goes against the Duke grain. Go and sit down at the lowest place. Who would boast, I'm a marginal reader, choose me. No one wants to be marginal. As you graduate, you wanna be the best, extraordinary movers and shakers in the world. The London Underground, or what is known as the Tube, is the oldest rapid transit system in the world. And in 1968, a recorded voice was installed to warn travelers to watch out for the space between the platform and the train every time the train stops. And if you've been there, you know that voice says, mind the gap. Mind the gap because if you don't, you may fall and hurt yourself. In life, if you don't mind the margins, you may fall because the margins or the fringes shouldn't be ignored. It's not just those who are honored who should find a place around the table of humanity, but those who are dishonored on a daily basis. If we don't mind the margins, mind the social gaps, we will miss the collective picture of humanity. Go and sit down at the lowest place Go and see what it's like to feel what others feel on the borderlands of human existence. 
to increase your empathy with those who always have to sit or be told to sit at the lowest place. Put yourself in someone else's shoes to see the world from a different perspective. Mind the margins. Inhabit the lowly places because they are actually central to society. Talk of borders has been in the news quite a bit. And borders in life or on a page are significant. There was a president of a major research university who shall not be named, but he's an English buff, and you might know him. And he appeared on the Colbert Report with Stephen Colbert. They discussed the American Academy of Arts and Sciences report on the importance of the humanities and social sciences in education. At one point, Colbert picked up that report and he started to point at the size of the margins on each page and he challenged the president by claiming he was stretching the report, making it longer with bigger margins. And I know none of us have ever done that. And Colbert, he claimed that if the margins weren't so long, the report, which was actually around 88 pages long, would only be eight pages long. But swiftly and wittingly, the president responded by saying, all serious readers know that margins are to keep your notes in. This president was none other than our president Broadhead, and I think he deserves some snaps of affirmation for that response. The margins on a page are a part of the reader's experience, a part of the full page. When we read a book, we may use the margins ourselves to emphasize what's important to us. We have all, in the words of former U.S. Poet Laureate Billy Collins, seized the white perimeter as our own and reached for a pen, if only to show we did not just laze in an armchair turning pages. We pressed a thought into the wayside, planted an impression along the verge. The margins can have lasting impressions on the borders of a book and a society. But some may never pay attention to the borders, especially the footnotes and the end notes. Those notes on the margins of a page because they are in smaller font, revealing somehow that they may not be as important as the main text. When writing books, editors may even encourage writers to limit the number of footnotes because what's in the margins seemingly isn't as important and can be viewed as a way of getting in the way of the reader, breaking the flow. But the irony is that the footnotes tell you the source for the information in the main text. They feed into what is central and tell you where to go for the source of knowledge. Without the footnotes, without the margins, you wouldn't have all of the necessary information at hand. You wouldn't have the whole story because without the fringe of a page or a community, you can't see the whole and know the fullness of God. The marginal information is sometimes commentary on the main body of the text. The margins matter and, and maybe it's the margins that tell us what kind of society this really is. The margins tell us who Jesus was because the marginalized were Jesus' tribe. He hung out with the least, the last, and the left out, which is why his second instruction is when you give a luncheon or dinner, don't invite your friends or brothers or your rich neighbors in case they may invite you and repay you. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. Invite those who aren't connected to power. Invite those who can never repay you. Be careful of befriending others just because you can get something from them and aren't really interested in them. Invite those who can't give you anything but themselves. They have no money, their health is bad, they are reliant on you, they are not the right network, or they don't have the right net worth. Invite those who aren't your usual associates. Engage those who are different. And by doing so, by inviting the poor, the, the lame, the crippled, the blind, those without college degrees and with great material and physical needs, you are telling them you are accepted. 
And so whether it be where you sit or whom you invite, the message is clear, class of 2017. Embrace places and peoples out of the normative cultural bounds. Choose the margins, the unacceptable, the periphery, the unpopular. If you want to be first, be last. Go against the grain and choose the lowly seat and invite the outcasts because God wants to broaden your relational borders. Choose the way that won't win you any awards or honorable mentions. Choose the way that may reward you with a burden or just make you a footnote. Choose what you really don't want in order to receive what you really need. And don't worry about seeking greatness. Seek humility. I know it gets a bad rap. But if you want to be great, be great in service. Do you want to be great? Be great in, in loving your neighbor or roommate who snores all night long. Do you want to be great? Be great in respecting the one who cleans bathrooms and sweeps floors and serves food in the student center and had to clean up after you on LDOC. Do you want to be great? Be great in complimenting someone else. Be great in loving. Be great in listening. Be great in giving. And perhaps even post-graduation, you'll receive a PhD in love. Do you want to be great? Mind the margins. Pay attention to what and who are on the border, for we need them. If we want to see the whole picture of life and experience the beloved community of God. For our destinies are intertwined. And without those on the margins, refugees, strangers, immigrants, widows, orphans, the hungry, the naked, the thirsty, the sick, the prisoner, the most vulnerable among us. Our future will be anorexic, and the dream of a beloved community will die. So I still hold fast to that border crossing dream captured in the words of the sonnet, The New Colossus, inscribed on a plaque on the inner wall of the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, the tempest tossed to me. I'll lift my lamp beside the golden door. And in other words, to channel the wannabe president, Kanye West, I'm just trying to say the way school need teachers the way Kathy Lee needed Regis, that's the way we need the fringes. We need each other. For the promise of our future is the expansion of our heart's borders. And maybe, just maybe, we'll see that borders aren't actually dangerous, but sites of hope where the dream of God can come true. That's my story. And I'm sticking to it. See you at the border.
you and I have something in common, a class of 2017. Have you heard? I'm graduating from Duke this spring, too. Is it any big surprise? I thought about it, but when I thought of carrying on here without you, what would be the fun of that? So I decided, if you're leaving, I'm going to. This fact has given me an uncanny empathy with you in the experience of your current transition. Earlier this year, a student who works in the president's office said to me, so President Broadhead, is this like your senior spring? I blushed. But to you, I will now confess that I have been feeling some lightening of the load, though I'm saving these shorts and flip-flops until you drive out of sight. But along with the rejoicing, we know that these end-time feelings actually have more complicated emotions. Another student in my office who enjoys using his extensive vocabulary said to me he was feeling beset with contrary emotions. And a third said that as his remaining Duke days grew shorter, he wanted to grab each one and hold it tight, but that the harder he tried to slow time's passage, the faster it seemed to go. So I've been thinking about what to say to you on this occasion, and it occurred to me that transitions are hard tests for a strength that people need to move forward. This is the strength that nowadays is referred to as resilience. The core meaning of that word is known to you all. If you know Latin or any Romance language, you know that a verb for to jump is buried in its etymology, and so resilience has to do with rebounding or bouncing back. But once I heard a use of this term that brought home to me a deeper significance than that. General Martin Dempsey is a Duke alumnus. Do you know him? He has an MA in English from this university, and he has until recently served as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, that is to say, the highest military advisor to the President of the United States. Since stepping down as head of the Joint Chiefs, uh, Marty Dempsey has been teaching at Duke and he came to speak to the Board of Trustees uh, last winter. He gave a little talk in which he listed causes for hope and causes for worry in the current geopolitical scene. And high on his worry list was what he called fear of lack of resilience from a terrorist attack. That line lodged itself in my mind. It came to, it's, it's the whole basis of this talk today. Uh, and when I started thinking about it, I thought, is that really what he said? Uh, so I wrote him a note, you know, he's my pal now. Uh, and, he is. And uh, I wrote him a note and I said, did you really, didn't you really say that your greatest fear is of a terrorist attack? Because I thought you said was that your fear was of lack of resilience from a terrorist attack. But he replied that I had it correct. He, he said, and I quote, the threat of terrorism can neither change the way we live nor the way we interact with the rest of the world unless we allow it to do so. You understand what he means. Terrorism aims not just to inflict finite physical destruction, but to bring about an infinite or limitless sense of insecurity and vulnerability, a sense of exposure so vast that we cease to act as we ordinarily would and begin hysterically reacting to largely imaginary threats. To resist this effect or to thwart this uh, chance of defeat, it's critical to rebound, to confidently reassert what we are proud to be. I learned this concept in another place from another of my teachers. I have had a very eclectic education at Duke. Perhaps you have too. This teacher is David Cutcliffe, the coach of the football team. Uh, I, a child of New England, will not attempt his wonderful Alabama accent, but these are his very words. David Cutcliffe said, I teach my players to think of the turf as a red hot griddle. When you're thrown down, you have to hop up as fast as if staying down there would cause you to be burned. Now, I didn't play varsity uh, sports when I, uh, in my younger days, but when I heard these words, I felt the profound lesson in them, and surely you did not think that all the lessons you learned here were learned in courses. Sports aren't about continual triumph. They're a contest where sometimes things go your way and sometimes they go against you, but when they go against you, the art is to get back up to process just what just happened, learn its lesson as quickly as you can, and then return yourself to the present moment, not dwelling on the past defeat, but putting yourself forward again as fresh and strong as you know how. So resilience means rebounding from something that would throw you down or lay you low. 
but you might ask why I have chosen to speak of resilience to you of all people. Are you not the class of 2017 emerging from success at Duke to begin the ongoing, if not eternal, story of success in your later life? Well, maybe you are. But you will lead a very unusual life if you never encounter failure or loss or frustration or even defeat. There's no living a human life without being buffeted by adversity in its thousand forms. Humans throughout history have known this perfectly well with only one tiny exception, and you belong to that exception. That exception is our contemporary culture of success the only a culture in the history of the world that has normalized the expectation that you could and should lead a whole life that it is an unbroken string of triumphs. This expectation may drive high achievement, but at heart it is delusional, a fantastic denial of obvious truths. And to show it, I'll give you some stories. Tomorrow morning, before conferring your degrees, I'm going to confer a series of seven honorary degrees. These are given to people who were just you X years ago, men and women sitting in some baccalaureate ceremony with hopes of what might be ahead of them, fears of what might be ahead of them, and they went on into the valley of the unknown, and there they have led such lives as to design, as to, as to define peak performance, peak achievement in their different uh, 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 chosen fields. So as I recite their inspiring accomplishments tomorrow, you will likely think, well, they had it easy. They never knew any uncertainty or any humiliating setbacks. But there, you would be wrong. One of these degrees is going to George Church, one of the world's foremost authorities on personal genomics, who flunked out of the biochemistry graduate program at Duke early in his career. I'm not making this up. A super smart Duke undergraduate George Church had taken upper level graduate classes in the sciences in his first term as a freshman. But when he re-enrolled in the graduate program, those same courses turned out to be degree, degree requirements for the graduate degree, so he had to take them over again. But he found taking the same class a second time so stupid and pointless and stultifying that he stopped doing the work and stopped going to the classes. And at the end of the term, he got a grade of F in courses he had aced at an earlier period. At this point, the graduate school kicked him out, and some bureaucrat, now roasting in the et eternal shame, uh, hell of shame, I imagine, tried to soften the blow to him by writing this condescending letter. This is a true quote. We hope that whatever problems of circumstance contributed to your lack of success at Duke will not keep you from successful pursuit of a productive career. He needn't have worried. Church continued his graduate studies at Harvard, where he is now a professor of genetics and founding director of the WIS Institute of Bio uh, Biologically Inspired Engineering. Another person I'm going to introduce you to tomorrow is L Loretta Lynch. You may know her name. She is a Durham native. She served for two terms as a widely admired and very tough US attorney for the Eastern District of New York before being named the Attorney General of the United States in 2015. Growing up black in a region not far then removed from the segregation days, when Loretta Lynch got the highest score on a standardized test in elementary school, school officials could not believe that a black student had uh, uh, possibly uh, uh, made such an achievement. So they required her to take the test over again, at which point, as her father, who still lives in Durham, endlessly boasted, she got an even higher score the second time. Clay Christensen, you, this is a name you probably do know, he's a Harvard Business School professor, uh, the inventor of the theory of disruptive innovation. His book, The Innovator's Dilemma, has been called one of the six most influential business books ever written. So surely his career must have taken the form of a straight line of endless and unbroken upward ascent. But in fact, Clay Christensen suffered a heart attack and then a cancer diagnosis, and then in the year 2010, a massive stroke that almost totally impaired his ability to speak. With heroic willpower and as much as eight hours a day of speech therapy, and if you want to do something that isn't fun, I suggest you try even half an hour of that, let alone eight hours of it. With that degree of speech therapy, Clay Christensen recovered his power to the extent that in the year 2012, he gave a brilliant talk to the Duke trustees 
beginning by explaining that during his whole speech, he would be staring at the floor because if he were to make eye contact with any human, he would lose his ability to find his words. Now, any of these setbacks could have been so discouraging as to be virtually career ending, you know that. If these men and women went on to achieve things that we will celebrate tomorrow, it's not because they were spared adversity, but because in face of profound setbacks, they were damned if they were going to be halted. They bounced back. They insisted on going on to write the story of their life the, the way they wanted that story to, uh, to be, rather than to be locked into a narrative of defeat. During your freshman orientation, do you remember this? You were the last class at Duke to have Maya Angelou speak at your freshman orientation. And I quote her now because she's the person who, to me, is the person who found the best words for this indomitability of spirit that I'm talking about. Do you know a poem by her that has a refrain? But still I rise. It keeps stanza after stanza. It enumerates things that are pressing you down. But at the end of each one, it didn't work because still I rise. After the greatest uh, disaster of his personal life, the death of his young son from typhoid fever, Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote these lines in his journal, I am defeated every day, but for victory was I born. Now I've heard it said that it's wrong to celebrate resilience as an all-sufficient virtue. Critics note that when resilience is the prescription, individuals are being asked to find the whole solution to problems in personal willpower, thus deflecting attention from social or structural barriers that can aggravate or sometimes even cause what we call personal limitations. I get that point. This is not a trivial matter. But how do we expect such structural restrictions to be overcome except through the strength and resilience of those who fight them? <coughs> Let me tell you something that really did happen in my senior spring, namely the assassination of Martin Luther King. King is rolling back the rule of legally enforced racial segregation in America, the accomplishment of King and his colleagues in the civil rights movement. This was not work for the weak of spirit or those easily cast down. It took persistent, endlessly renewed self-assertion against seemingly immovable obstacles and terrifying personal threats, including the bomb that was set off in King's house with his wife and baby there while he was leading the Montgomery bus boycott in 1956, and the death threat he spoke of in what proved to be his last speech. I hope there's some difference you want to make. I hope that's the success you aspire to. And it's not impossible. Differences have been made. All kinds of differences have been made by men and women whose powers are actually not fundamentally different from the ones, uh, from the ones you have here. But it's worth remembering that differences are not made by complaining that they are not needed. They're made with work through struggle against obstacles by people who are defeated every day in some measure, perhaps, but who rebound, who keep revisualizing the thing they care for or find worth fighting for, people who never lose uh, the sound of some uh, never extinguished inner voice that says, but still I rise. Class of 2017, I hope you leave Duke with many happy memories. I'm sure you do. But your life here cannot possibly have been a solid run of bliss. This was a place of self-discovery in the cauldron of challenge. If Duke has had a formative or transformative effect on you, it can only have been through this mix of struggle and success. Now it's time to take the self you became here out into the world of adult responsibilities where you'll face new successes and new challenges, continuing to grow through the tutelage of those both. You'll do fine if you absorb what life throws at you and find the resilience to keep advancing toward what you find important to do. Have you got that? If so, there is no longer any need to be beset by contrary emotions. Good things are about to be, lie behind you. Even better things are about to lie ahead of you. Are you ready? Let's get out of here.
please stand. <clears throat> the world needs a blessing, and you are that blessing. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forever. Amen.